गुड इवनिंग संजय सर गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग लक्ष्मी मैडम है शेयर वन फोटोग्राफ अबाउट मीटिंग आई डी एंड पासवर्ड सो देर इज समिस्क्रिपन्सी इन दीटिंग आई डी the photograph that she has shared the meeting id is not correct but what you have shared is correct so using the link that you have shared it is easy to log in for this zoom meeting sir okay i thought she had just copied and sent what i had uh, no, this no, thing no. was it something different yes sir the meeting id is missing one word uh, one letter i mean to say so oh, maybe number. then when she has cut when she has ah. cut pasted <laughs> maybe there is a there is some issue yes. some issue so one, one number is less Uh, so what I will uh, no, so uh, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to send it again? Yes, sir. Please share it once more. Also, I don't know how many because if it's more than hundred, uh, it it will go to uh, uh, it will go to YouTube. There is also a YouTube link. so i will send it uh, to your to the pediatric urology group yes yes sir so oh, link uh, link the um, um meeting can can you hear me now yes much much better much better okay. Okay. much better no i believe there uh, there was some issue with the uh, with the um, with the link that was circulated as what i think milind was telling yes, um, yes i'll just resend it because um so one minute i'll just there is a, see if there are more than uh, 100 people uh, it will go on to youtube you know so i am sending the youtube link as well the uh, link and address is correct sir yeah so i will i will i will resend the link i will resend yes, the yes. link yes oh, okay good evening good evening good evening uh, ramesh sorry i brief yeah good evening Yes, YouTube link also is visible, sir. Yeah, so both are visible. Uh, maybe yes. you can just post it to wherever. I mean, if it's beyond hundred, then it will go. You know, you cannot more than hundred cannot log in. So I don't know how many people right. will log in. But anyway, it is streaming, so it's okay. Yeah. I see a lot of yeah. yeah, Lakshmi, you are clear now. Whatever you did was is working fine. Present. It's okay, much clearer sorry, now. Email of the presentation. Okay. Clean her glasses. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's much clearer now. So are you are you okay now? Are 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 you? Is it clear? Can you hear us? Yeah, it's clear now. It's clear to me. Um, yeah, it's it's clear. So so so, we'll so what I will do is people be able to share the screen. Are we going to be able to? Yeah, you can allow whomever you want. So I'll make you co-host. You can share okay. it with whomever you want. If somebody else, uh, you know, you want to help, uh, want help, I can make them co-host as well. Uh, you know, so see, I can tell you who all are going to present. There is Kirtika. Okay, hold, hold on, one minute. So I'll make you co-host. One second. Yeah. Co-host. Uh, then Kirtika. Okay. Yeah. And then Jasil. I don't think he's yet. One minute. One. Okay, Jasil, I can't see Jasil. Not yet logged in, I think. Uh, Doctor Narasimhan. Uh, Narasimhan was the first person to log in, but I can't see his name here now. Ah, he's there. Oh, he's there. He's there. He's there. Okay, uh, Sanjay Narasimhan's name is there. Oh. Yes, yes, I've got oh. it. I've, I've made it. I've made him co-host. Yeah. Okay. And um, later on, I think Doctor Jasil will join, and then once he joins, he also needs to become co-host. Yeah, you can. I mean, you can do it. Or if you want, I'll. I can make somebody else also uh, co-host. Maybe uh, Ramesh or Sandeep Puar is going yeah. to be there till the end of this, so they can help you out. Yeah, 
Will that be okay? Yeah, I don't know how to make somebody co-host. So. <laughs> Who else? No, so, so uh, Ramesh, Ramesh, come on. Ramesh, uh, I will make you co-host so you can help uh, help out with. Uh... Sorry, yeah, yeah. Tell me. No, so I I think in case there is some technical issue about you know people making people sharing screens and things, I will I will make you co-host so in, you know you can probably get people in and out for. Yeah. Okay. Controlling this thing. Yeah. I've got I've got everybody to send me their presentations, so I've got that. Yeah. So uh, you you said Jashil, no? Okay. Yeah, Jasil has Jaseel. not yet logged in. Uh, has okay. No, so he hasn't laid logged. So everybody okay. else is there. So you can yeah. always make him, you know, co-host. It should yeah. not be a problem. Otherwise, okay. Ramesh could probably help. Yeah. Dr. Santosh also said he may be late. So we may move his presentation to next time. We don't know. Okay. Dr. Saha has not yet joined, I think. Okay, we're ready to start. Yeah, we're ready to start. Yeah. So we're ready to start. Hello. Okay, uh, Jasil is logged in, so you can make him also co host. So Dr. Saha will be joining shortly. Can I start? Yeah, Keetika, are you ready with your presentation? Uh, yes, ma'am, I'll just share my screen. Okay. Uh, Dr. Saha has also joined. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. If, uh, yeah, please. So I welcome everybody to this first um, session of um, complex case discussions. Um, and uh, the moderators for today's session will be Dr. Subhasi Saha and Dr. Ramesh Babu. What I would uh, want is for people to- send... Hello. I would request people who are not presenting to kindly mute themselves. People having any questions, kindly do put it on the chat box. Dr. Milin Joshi will be looking at the chat messages and uh, We'd be able to discuss that during the, um, you know, after the presentation is finished. So we have 10 minutes for each case presentation and 10 minutes for discussion. So we'd be having uh, mostly three cases today. Dr. Um, Santosh said he might be late. So if, if that is the case, uh, as a standby, we've got our case, which we would add on as a third case today. Okay, so we'll start with the first case, which is bilateral Wilms tumor from the team at Ames and Dr. Keetika is presenting this. A uh, very good evening, everybody. Today I'll be uh, discussing about a case of bilateral Wilms tumor, uh, which had presented to our uh, hospital. Uh, a one-year-old girl presented to our OPD with complaints of a rapidly progressing uh, abdominal distension and a right-sided abdominal lump for the past one month, which is progressively increasing in size. And there was associated history of loss of appetite. Uh, but there were no other history of uh, hematuria, vomiting, urinary retention, or uh, there was no history of fever, pain, abdomen, uh, jaundice, bleeding per rectum. And there was no documented weight loss or loss of appetite. And there was no history of similar complaints in the family. On examination, the child was uh, conscious, coherent, febrile, and she was pale and was thin built. There was uh, no evidence of ictus, ed uh, edema, generalized lymphadenopathy, and there were no uh, signs of syndromic association of Wilms tumor, that is the eyes, external genitalia, and they uh, were normal, and there was no evidence of any hemihypertrophy. And uh, the child was uh, uh, weighing 9 kg, and her vitals uh, were stable, that is her heart rate was 96 beats per minute, and the blood know. was 92 over 48 millimeters of mercury. And uh, on auscultation, the uh, cardiovascular and respiratory uh, system were normal. Uh, and uh, coming to abdominal examination, uh, her abdomen was soft but distended and dilated veins were visible over the abdomen. The abdomen was uh, central and inverted 
and a bilateral renal lump was palpable a 10 by 7 cm uh, large firm lump was palpable on the uh, in the right lumbar region extending into the right hypochondrium and on the left side there was a 4 4 to 3 cm lump palpable in yeah. the left lumbar region. Uh, the child was initially evaluated at a local hospital where an ultrasound abdomen was done, which was suggestive of a bilateral renal mass, which the patient was then referred to AIMS. And we had done a CECT chest and abdomen, uh, which was suggestive of bilateral Rims tumor and uh, as per the NWTS 5 protocol, we started the child on neoadjuvant chemotherapy. A three drug regimen was started uh, with Winkristin, Actinomycin D and Doxorubicin. And six cycles of uh, neoadjuvant chemo were given from 13th of January to 17th of February, following which the response evaluation was done by a uh, contrast and CT scan, which I'll be discussing a little later on. And the echocardiographic evaluation done at this point was a uh, revealed uh, normal uh, study and the ejection fraction was 60%. And, and uh, in view of uh, uh, non-response of the tumor after six cycles, we had uh, decided to go ahead with an open biopsy and the child yeah. underwent uh, open biopsy on 1st of April. And following that, and the biopsy d uh, didn't reveal any evidence of anaplasia or high grade tumor. So for that, uh, we had uh, continued the chemotherapy for this child and she received the six courses. Uh, following which, uh, she was then planned for uh, surgical uh, excision. CT uh, scan images of the uh, patient. If you can see... Uh, if you can see here, over here, we can see the uh, right renal lump and uh, another renal lump on the left side of the uh, uh, abdomen. And the right side kidney mass was uh, pretty large. It was compressing the renal parenchyma. And uh, the IVC here was not visualized. And the left renal mass was, ar uh, was arising mainly from the upper pole of the kidney. That was and the uh, uh, CCT chest had revealed uh, no evidence of metastasis. This was the first uh, CT scan which was done at presentation to us. And this is the second CT scan which was done after six weeks of uh, chemotherapy in which we can see that the tumor had become a little heterogeneous but the uh, size had not significantly decreased in size. And uh, hence we had uh, for, uh, given further courses of chemotherapy. And this is the, uh, here we can see that the IVC is encased, but uh, there was no evidence of uh, tumor thrombus which was seen. And uh, on CCT chest, there was uh, infective changes which were seen, uh, like air trapping, but there was no evidence of any metastatic nodules. So this is the comparison of the CT scans at after six weeks and after 12 weeks of chemotherapy, wherein the tumor size had not uh, significantly decreased in size. And uh, uh, so uh, as, as post-12 weeks of chemotherapy, it is uh, advisable to go ahead with surgical excision. So we had done planned for a surgical excision of the uh, both the renal tumors in a single sitting. But at this point of time, hypertension was uh, detected in this child. Uh, BP was more than the 95th centile. And also cardiac evaluation had revealed severe left ventricular dysfunction. Uh, as we can see over here, uh, the uh, cardiac... Uh, that is the uh, child over here. The, the child was in the phase of asymptomatic cardiotoxicity. So, for management of that, we had started the patient on uh, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, and uh, that is furosemide, spironolactone were given. And the child also received enalapril and carvedilol. And, uh, and enoxaparin was also given in the perioperative. <laughs> So uh, once the hypertension was stabilized and a baseline GFR estimation was done, and we had even uh, sought a pediatric nephrology consultation for as a precautionary measure for renal failure in the post-operative period, and a hemodialysis catheter was inserted, and uh, nephrotoxic medications were avoided, and uh, 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 we had uh, taken measures to avoid uh, acute renal injury in the post-operative period. Yeah, no. And uh, ma'am, should I go ahead with the surgical management as well? Yeah, you have yeah. 10 minutes, so you can please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this was the, uh, interoperatively, we had gone for, uh, uh, the child was posted for surgery and a right transverse, uh, uh, midline, uh, right transverse incision was, uh, supraumbilical incision was placed. And the, after uh, reflecting the colon medially, we had delivered the right kidney, which we can oh. see completely replaced by the tumor. And uh, 
There is a tumor thrombus, which is noted in both the upper and renal veins, which, which was an intraoperative surprise for us. That is, it was not detected on the preoperative CT scans. And the thrombus was extending into the inferior vena cava as well. Uh, so after uh, securing the uh, control for the IVC above and below the level of the thrombus, uh, we had gone ahead for uh, uh, the, that is, the cavotomy was done and the thrombus was retrieved. Uh, so uh, this was another uh, thrombus in the up, that is the lower venous uh, the thrombus in the lower renal vein was initially handled and the IVC was repaired at that point. Following which, the uh, tumor thrombus in the upper renal vein was tackled, and this had to be dissected out by sharp dissection because uh, the tumor uh, thrombus was adherent to the wo uh, wall of the vessel. And this was the operative specimen of the right kidney. And after that, uh, as since the child was uh, stable, that is the uh, interoperatively, we had confirmed with the anesthesia team that the child was uh, still maintaining vitals, following which we had uh, gone ahead to explore the left uh, left side of the abdomen as well. And the tumor uh, uh, was seen not, uh, noted involving the upper pole of the kidney, which was excised. And uh, this is the post uh, excision picture. And uh, after that, the uh, exposed calyx was then closed over a DJ stent. And in the perioperative period, uh, the child had received uh, intra intravenous antibiotics for five days and she was started on oral feeds from postoperative day three. And the antihypertensive medications were continued even in the perioperative period. And she had, uh, she had received warfarin, the enoxaparin was stopped and warfarin was started and we were monitoring for her uh, PTI and our values. And initially, there was urine output noted from the uh, drain, which had gradually decreased, and the drain was uh, removed on post-op day five. And the child was discharged in an active, uh, in a stable condition. And this was the post-operative histopathology specimen. And these were the uh, slides wherein we can see that uh, there were all all the three uh, elements were noted. This was these are the blastemal elements and the stromal elements, as well as the tubules were also seen in both the right and the left kidney. Uh, these are the tubules and uh, surrounding stroma can also be seen in this image. Uh, so on follow-up, uh, the child had received uh, adjuvant chemotherapy for uh, till week 24, and uh, but uh, adriamycin-free chemotherapy was administered and radiotherapy was not given in order to avoid further renal damage to the residual parenchyma and also uh, she was a high risk for general uh, repeated general anesthesia so radiotherapy was avoided and uh, dg stent removal was done in the post operative period after 6 weeks and the patient has been under regular follow up with us and currently she is asymptomatic there's no recurrence of tumor which is uh, which is noted and uh, right now her bp has uh, stabilized it is 104 over 78 millimeters of mercury and she's still on the antihypertensive medication and uh, a recent ultrasound and CT scan, which was done, had revealed no evidence of, of any recurrence of metastatic disease. And uh, her uh, renal function tests were normal. And a GFR, which was done uh, to assess for uh, renal function, had revealed a it was uh, 75 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square. And RDS had, was suggestive of a functioning left kidney with non obstructive clearance. And a repeat uh, cardiac evaluation was done, which would uh, suggest, which has shown an improving trend in the left ventricular rejection fraction. And also there was a clot noted preoperatively in the left ventricle, which should also improved. Uh, that's it, ma'am. This, uh, this was our uh, case, ma'am. Okay. So, madam, there is one question for Dr. Kirtiga. Why okay. open by... Why open biopsy was done and not USG guided when USG guided is less invasive option available? So, was there any particular preference for this open biopsy? Uh, so it was a, a bilateral renal mass, and also we wanted to take it from the uh, like uh, to look for the extent of the tumor and also to take it from the uh, representative site. We had gone ahead with an open renal biopsy, sir. So you had you had a detailed CT scan available. So, I mean, extent of the lesion, do you? Uh, I mean, is there any advantage in uh, uh, doing a laparotomy and assessing? I mean, does it may add to the uh, your knowledge? Sir, so open renal, uh, or the percutaneous biopsy, the tissue sample might not be adequate, whereas open right. renal biopsy, uh, usually we get a good uh, amount of tissue and that would be definitive right. uh, for... Uh, now, had had your uh, CT scan of the thorax showed some uh, metastatic lesions in the lungs, uh, 
what would be the difference in a plan of treatment? Would you have done anything different? Like, uh, sir, uh, we uh, we would have upgraded the chemotherapy. Uh, one was apart from the three drug regimen, and then uh, mm -hmm. we would have gone ahead for repeat evaluation. Right. Is there any role of any any? I mean, uh, especially for the left sided where you did a partial nephrectomy. Is there any 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 other thing which uh, may help you in just demarcating the uh, disease from the non disease part, uh, except from the uh, CT radiological guidance? Anything else uh, which is available nowadays uh, for on table assessment of the diseased and non diseased part? I'll yeah. take the questions because uh, actually I think uh, we took it as a case presentation. So if yeah. you don't mind, sir, can I answer these questions? For yeah, you? please, 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 please go ahead. Yeah. I, it is uh, just so, for the discussion. Yeah, it's, it's just I mean, for discussion, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so so that, because actually she won't be able to carry for the discussion. So I'll just yeah, say, please, uh, please, please, uh, Dr. Jain, you. Uh, yes. Uh, sir, so regarding the biopsy part, uh, you're totally right. So the main reason to do a biopsy was because uh, at six weeks, we were not seeing any response. So uh, the main thing was that if we get a rhabdomyoblastic histopathology, then we know that probably this mass will not uh, respond too much to chemotherapy because those stromal components are not very responsive. So that was one thing. And second thing is if the biopsy shows anaplasia or things or uh, anaplasia, then definitely a, a grade of chemotherapy is uh, required. And uh, COG uh, regarding the biopsy part of doing a needle biopsy, so COG, I think it recommends open biopsy, but uh, uh, we have sometimes our colleagues have tried needle biopsies and we have noticed a rupture after of the tumor after that and even taking the patient to emergency. So we are slightly hesitant, but as we all know, the UK group does routinely does a, a needle biopsy for their patients to make a diagnosis. So those who are comfortable with that, it's fine, but uh, we are uh, more uh, happy with the uh, open biopsy if needed, if there's no response. Had the patient shown a good response, we would have gone ahead with the uh, surgery. And thirdly, regarding the metastasis, if the metastasis was present, then the chemo would have remained the same. But at the six weeks, we would have classified this patient as a rapid responder or slow responder. So if he was a rapid responder, we have gone, uh, we have would have continued with the chemotherapy. And if it was a, a slow responder, then we would have uh, changed it to uh, the regime M and started him, the patient on, uh, given him chest radiotherapy. If, uh, but in view of cardiotoxicity, the things become more, more, much more complicated regarding the radiotherapy to chest. So probably then we have, would have taken consultations from the sister departments and uh, uh, really what to do. Oh, thank you. Uh, was um, a Doppler done for the renal veins? Uh, sir, actually, huh, that's a very good question, sir, because uh, what we were initially getting a doctor done for every patient uh, years back. But they said that after that, a paper came from COG that uh, probably if you only have doubt in CT scan, then you should uh, uh, get the ultrasound doppler done. So we dropped this practice and mm -hmm. we discussed this patient multiple times during our radio conference. So every time, because maybe that thrombus was adherent to the IVC, it was no, no. interpreted as a, uh, yeah. No, no, no. The CT attenuation value is exactly the same as uh, uh, as normal blood. And unless it becomes very, very dense, only then you'll start seeing the thrombus. So that is that is the problem. So, uh, you know, only in advanced cases, the CT scan will show a thrombus. So in early cases, it's only a Doppler which will show a thrombus or an MRI. But MRI generally one would not really uh, do for such a case. Uh, but uh, a Doppler, I think, should be a part of the protocol. Uh, yes, sir. Well, uh, but actually, it was. But after that paper from COG, because definitely they have a lot of data and they are able to present facts to us. So uh, the what that paper had concluded, I think it was a paper very old. Uh, Sandeep sir can probably remember the exact. I, I agree. Paper. I agree with Dr. Dasmeet. And in fact, as Vishesh is mentioning earlier, when we were doing Doppler for all the patients at presentation. Our incidence of pickup of IVC and renal vein thrombus was around 11.4%. And since after this paper, when we stopped doing the doctor, it has come down to around 7 to 8%. So as you're mentioning, the earlier small thrombus gets missed unless a doctor is done. And that uh, comes up as a surprise during surgery. So if you yeah. the steps which are mentioned by the COG, they still mention that during surgery, the you have to assess the IVC and the renal vein for thrombus, irrespective of what the CT scan is showing. So yeah. I, 
we should stick with the policy of doing doppler i think so i think so too especially in a bilateral case you know where you're more uh, you know you want to be more sure about your uh, anatomy uh, before you go in so i think your color doppler should be a part of the protocol irrespective of whatever cog says can i ask some basic questions for the sake of all the students and stuff um this is um, a favorable histology right or unfavorable the favorable histology sir mm. Okay, so in that case, will you be getting the information on LOH in this patient or not needed? Uh, so we uh, need the information on uh, LOH as well, sir. So will that come from tumor biology or how does it? How do you? How long does it take? That is not being done routinely at the institute right now. Uh, some okay. it is being done as a part of a project, so the report is not available on real time because it's part of a project. So we get to know the report very uh, pretty much late right now. Uh, right now we're not getting the report, but they're collecting the samples. So currently our management uh, at Ames is not being managed uh, changed by because we don't have access to these reports, so it's not being uh, uh, managed on the basis of that. And that also brings me the other question: like if it is a favorable histology with all triphasic elements, why did it not respond to the chemotherapy? I mean, is it something to do with again tumor biology or? Uh, so maybe because it's a, it was a rhabdomyomatous uh, histology. So once you have a lot of stromal components, uh, these tumors do not respond very well to chemotherapy. So I think Kirtika uh, failed to mention it. In the histopathology, though all the elements uh, triphasic were present, but majority of the part was rhabdomyoblastic, which is a mature stromal kind of tissue which does not respond to chemotherapy. And this is a fact which is also mentioned by all the cooperative trials that after six weeks, and especially in patients who are Vagar syndrome or Dennis Dash syndrome, one must suspect rhabdomyoblastic and uh, try attempt to resect the uh, patients. Your question, initial question of why open biopsy, the protocols mentioned that at six weeks, you should attempt, do a laparotomy and see if the tumor is resectable. If not, do the open biopsy and come out. But rhabdomyoblastic, again, I will highlight because students are there, is not the same as rhabdomyoblastic. So for everybody, rhabdoid is a totally different tumor and not a Wim's tumor. But rhabdomyoblastic is one of the favorable histology Wim's tumor, but they don't respond to chemotherapy. I have I have the, some confusion about when was the biopsy done? Was it done before starting chemotherapy or after giving six weeks chemotherapy? After, after six weeks of chemotherapy. Okay, after six weeks of chemotherapy, we decided to do biopsy because it was not responding. Yes. Right? Now, someone has asked in the chat box, I think Lakshmi has asked, what about staging these bilateral surgeries? I mean, should, could we have done the partial nephrectomy first and then, uh, then done the total nephrectomy? I also had the same doubt. Uh, sir, the reason was because in this case, what, uh, because the IVC thrombus was not very clear on the CT scan. So, what has been portrayed to us was that a tumor on the right side, which is encasing the IVC, making it an unresectable tumor so uh, a disease so that's why we wanted to go on that side and see whether we can we knew that we cannot salvage any parenchyma there because the whole of the parenchyma was parenchyma was involved and we can also see in the biopsy specimen so because it was portrayed to us as a tumor which is encasing the ivc so we went there first to see whether we can uh, remove that tumor or not and partial effect we always knew that we could do and anyway we were planning for a simultaneous surgery uh, in this patient so that was the things that were going on in mind, but uh, definitely it can depend on the surgeon preference. And what was the extent of this throat tumor thrombus? Sir, it was oh, just at, at the IVC, just going a couple of centimeters into the IVC. So if was it adherent in that sense, could we have done a cavectomy and then done a grafting in, uh, rather than make it like a residual tumor? Uh, sir, we were able to resect it easily, uh, both the sites. And uh, definitely that is the importance of knowing beforehand if you have IVC thrombus because we were not prepared for a cavectomy or a graft or things like that. But we were lucky enough that it was tumor which was just peeping into the IVC requiring on a cavotomy uh, at the local area only. So uh, these things were not required in our case. So, so small areas, small areas of adhesion to the IVC one can resect as you said. 
a portion of the uh, IVC can be removed and IVC closed primarily. But if it's a large area, then obviously you have to put a graft on, on, on to that IVC. But and my understanding is if you again, remove it completely, it will be stage two, right? Or not? Uh, so, sir, we, because we follow okay. COG protocol and we gave pre-op chemotherapy, so for us, it is local stage three, but now a uh, recent trial, which was published in COG in uh, this year itself, uh, uh, last year, sorry. So uh, I think now they're saying that pre-op chemo doesn't make a difference because you're, you're going to give that. So only if the local area, if you find lymph nodes or you do a spill, then you consider it as stage three. So that philosophy of that every pre-op chemotherapy according to COG probably can be taken as stage three does not apply here. So here it was, if we talk about it, then uh, putting everything to perspective, it was local stage uh, two disease. You are right, it's not stage three. No, yes. But was the tumor thrombus adherent to the IVC or was it just coming out easily? Sir, the lower one was coming out easily. The upper one, just at the junction of the renal and IVC, we had to use a, a sharp dissection to get it off. There was just a couple of strands which were making it adherent. It was not free-floating which we divided. So it sounds like stage three to me. Because there could be a microscopic residual disease there, right? So I, I, I will just uh, take that because uh, our past experience has shown that most of these thrombus on pathology don't show any, any viable tumor. So we are now more and more trying to avoid doing uh, IVC resections because anyway, there's no viable tumor. It's only fibrosis. So yeah. yes, Right. If there's infiltration of the IVC wall, it becomes stage three, no doubt. In our treatment, no. would be whether you get radiotherapy or not. Yeah. Thank you. We'll move on to the next case here. Thanks, sir. No, so Sandeep, sir, one small comment for the because the, many of the under uh, our PG are attending this uh, seminar um, uh, uh, symposium. Uh, for the bilateral Wilms tumor, LOH study has not been shown in the COG group. That's why for the bilateral cases, the LOH does not affect the prognosis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jadindra. I think uh, right. Dr. Narasimhan, if uh, is Dr. Narasimhan available for the next case? Can you hear me? Okay, sir. Please, okay. please go ahead and you can share your screen. Uh, thank you. Uh, mine is comparatively, I think, very, can you see my screen? Can, yes, sir, yeah. can, can see can you see my screen yeah we can, can just go the full, full screen, screen. Yeah, thanks i've gone to the full screen i think okay uh, i'm just going to present a very simple thing huh? uh, for your uh, for you all guys this may be very silly so i after listening to bilateral films, i thought uh, ames has done a very good job i don't know why people are going after their blood anyway this case is very simple let's go through the cases so I'm describing only three patients which look very similar, but have different pathologies. And uh, I, my colleague, Dr. Cheong Yiling, is also attending this meeting. We both manage this patient, so I acknowledge her presence. So this is a first child, and anybody can guess the diagnosis. It's quite straightforward. It's bulging, and uh, the patient has got a suprapubic fullness and is able to void, and if you do an ultrasound, there's a distended uterus, and this is an imperforate hymen. It's very simple to manage, and it's very straightforward. So what is this? This is more complicated. It looks like the same, but uh, uh, actually, uh, there was a newborn baby who was reported to have a mass protruding from the introitus, and somebody did an MRI. And this was uh, reported as a swelling arising from the lateral vaginal ball. The right kidney was uh, abnormal. Um, and the left kidney and the bladder was normal. So it could easily be catheterized. The patient could be catheterized. Uh, so this is the MRI picture. You can see that the vagina is distended with something, but the the structure is the cystic structure is communicating with the kidney, which is multi they have reported that as multi cystic kidney, and they had reported in the other sections that the left kidney is normal, the right kidney is multi cystic. So what I we did was to inject contrast into the swelling. The contrast went into the vagina and then went into the left uh, uh, the right kidney. 
the left kidney could not be seen. The catheter is in the bladder, so this was not going into the bladder, but was going to the vagina. So we just did a simply, we simply deroofed the urethroseal, and uh, the ectopic ureter, which was presenting as a urethroseal in the vagina, was draining outside, I guess. So the child will have urinary incontinence, but because it's nappy age, nobody will know it. So we are thinking that we will do a refractory of MCDK at a later stage. So this is slightly different from the first case, though it looks similar. They, I've drawn a picture for everybody. You can see that uh, the right side kidney is multicystic and it's opening into the vagina as a urethroseal and that is bulging out. And the left kidney is normal and that should be producing normal urine. So I, the third case has got a similar clinical appearance, but it's a different pathology. So this was the, again, a female child delivered at 36 weeks, antenatally had multicystic dysplastic kidney on one side, that is right side. And uh, this was confirmed on a postnatal ultrasound. And the child had uh, also had two uterine horse, uh, horns on ultrasound, which was identified on ultrasound. Child was all right and went home and uh, was asymptomatic. But after a month, the child presented with a bulging cystic swelling in the introitus. She did not, did not have any urinary retention or constipation, or there were no palpable abdominal muscles. The repeat ultrasonography revealed that there was a distended obstructed right hemivagina with uterus dialphus and ipsilateral MCDK. There was also another cystic yeah, structure. So somebody is so talking. Somebody wants... to... Hello? Does somebody want to say something? Hello? Uh, can we mute that person? Are you in the room? Why there? Anyway. Uh, repeat ultrasonography. Can we mute the other person who was speaking? Until I finish, please. Repeat ultrasonography revealed the standard obstructed right hemivagina associated with uterine dialphus and ipsilateral MCDK. So this is how it looked. It also looks like a vulval mass. And... Uh, the urethral meatus was normal, we could catheterize. So we aspirated the cyst, it gave some yellowish fluid and we injected some contrast. I'm just going to show the pictures. So the contrast went into, I thought it will go into the bladder, but it went in like that, like into the vagina and then the dialphus was demonstrated. So uh, we could see the, we could, uh, Subsequently, I, I'll just go to the next picture. We just de the cyst and uh, give me one second. Okay, so we, can you see this, the, uh, my cursor? Yeah. Okay, so this one, when we de this was the obstructed, I think one half, one hemivagina and there's another hemivagina. There are two hemivaginas you can see. We stitched it up and then this uh, actually is, uh, obstructed heavy vagina of ovira and uh, this was presenting like an interlabial mass. So, of course, interlabial masses can be more, some more things like um, um, uh, tumors can prolapse out and all that, but they're slightly in older children. The newborns, uh, so these three were three different kinds of swellings which were presenting in the first month of life. And so I just thought I'll put them up for a discussion. So this is the picture I have put for the obstructed heavy vagina, just a di diagram di diagrammatic picture. So it need not be that you have imperfect uh, hymen of uh, a single vagina. It can be a double vagina and one of them can be blocked. So follow up this child, the right MCDK had atrophied and so she did not need any surgery and she's just so manic. She's now nine or 10 years old and she's turned just around pubertal age. She's got no symptoms. So I think the lessons learned is that uh, careful assessment and planning helps. Knowledge of developmental anatomy is useful. I think contrast injection into the cyst, if it's not a simple imperfect hymen is useful and uh, it helps in planning. But of course, MRI, if it's there, it is very useful. I think the question, cases are open for discussion.
Yeah, thank you, Dr. Narsivan. This is so interesting cases. So one thing is, I mean, uh, theoretically, embryologically, in a multicystic dysplastic kidney, do we get a ureter? I mean, as your ureterocele case you described, ureterocele along with the multicystic dysplastic on the same oh, side. I mean, okay, that's a, just a radiologic diagnosis. Degeneration, yeah. I it's mean, a radiologic diagnosis. You should not yeah. uh, mix, mix, mix up radiologic diagnosis with yeah. histological Cystic diagnosis. Degeneration. They are saying that this is multicystic dysplastic. It's some dysplastic yeah. kidney, but I'm not sure... Uh, the, the both the cases had a dilated ureter, which could be seen on repeated images. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And uh, uh, whether they were communicating with the kidney or not, I'm not sure. And we have not removed any structure. Thank you. Of course, what I would Anybody wants to ask me questions uh, on this? These are two oh, simple no, cases for our audience. Our audience likes the very complicated and esoteric discussions, I think. Good cases. Thank you. Thank you. Good cases. Very good cases. Who is this? Oh, Ramesh. Okay. Ah. Thank you, Ramesh. How did you keep patients to do the diet study before, means planning a diet study along with the aspiration? I didn't understand the question. Can you repeat the question? Seeing a baby with the distended um, or oh, in the on the table OT inside the OT. This was done. You were examining in the theater and then did yeah, in the OT we did that. We have already, already had MRI, so, so we sort of knew what we were going to do, but we just did. Uh, I was just curious as to what it will show up, and I was very surprised that it could show up very good information. Yeah, thank you. Nice cases. We can move on to the next uh, presentation. Uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Santosh has uh, joined in. He was busy. Can go on to your case. Yeah, Jaseel, can you present our case, please? Can you can you share yes, the please. screen, Dr. Narsim, please? Thank you. Is that okay? Can I Nice. Uh, hello, <laughs> can, can you hear me, sir? Uh, just so we can hear you. Can you go a little slow? Because first case was really fast. We have a lot of time now, so we can discuss slowly. <laughs> okay, sir. It's a small case only. <laughs> go to the first slide. Yes, yes. Um, good evening all. And this is a story of a five-year-old boy who was accidentally detected uh, left hydronephrosis. At 38, two weeks, uh, left pelvic, uh, pelvis diameter was 10 mm. So he delivered at, uh, at uh, term with uh, LSES and um, uh, day one, urea when 10 months creat was 0. 0.7. At the day 13, creat was uh, 0. 0.5. At the day 13, uh, UST showed bilateral hydrourethronephrosis with an APD of uh, 10 mm on right side and left of 8 mm. Both ureters dilated up to VUJ uh, and a thick uh, bladder wall was noted. Uh, so at day 28, uh, someone did a cystoscopy and uh, whether we are not uh, available uh, what uh, they have done and uh, uh, fulguration of valve was done or not, it's not sure, but according to the parents, fulguration was done. And uh, at that time, uh, there was no MCU available. So then uh, th at third month, the ultrasound again showed bilateral hydrourethronephrosis with an APD of uh, 9 mm on both sides and both ureters again dilated up to VUJ. So at uh, nine months, uh, the first UTI has happened and the kidneys uh, on right side moderate hydrourethronephrosis with uh, uh, APD of 12 mm and with pelvis and ureteric uh, wall thickening and uh, uh, left kidney of APD 11 mm. Uh, there was no ureteric dilatation and bladder wall was thickened. And uh, that was treated as uh, right pyourethronephrosis. Uh, at uh, three years, then they were uh, consulting in between and uh, at, uh, doing uh, ultrasounds regularly. And at three years, uh, right kidney, uh, pelvic aliceal dilatation uh, with APD of 20 mm and uh, you know, ureter was dilated uh, and lower end was uh, dilated ureter was 8 mm. Uh, parenchymal thickness of 7 mm in the kidney and left kidney was um, uh, pelvic test of only 4 mm at that time and uh, ureter was uh, not mentioned as dilated. Then uh, they were diagnosed to as a right VUJ obstruction. 
so then child in between uh, child uh, um, uh, got recurrent utis uh, at 5 years of age he uh, had a uti with a pseudomonas and uh, created that time was 0.7 with this they visited an adult urologist uh, he did an mcu um, which as you can see that uh, there is a um, uh, the urethra in with these pictures were normal and the bladder looked normal and uh, left side there was a reflex of uh, uh, about uh, grade 3 to 4 and uh, right side uh, the, uh, there was no reflex so with this uh, they were uh, treated it as a right to vujo and a left to vur of uh, uh, grade 3 uh, with this um, uh, uh, the surgeon did a bilateral ureteric reimplantation uh, the adult urologist the polyterno led better as he is documented and uh, he approached it both you know, like extra vesicle and uh, trans vesicle approach uh, he went inside and uh, mobilized the ure uh, ureter up to the uh, up to distally up to the bladder and uh, extra vesically mobilized the ureter uh, ureter and then uh, he uh, uh, go uh, went ahead with the uh, polytano led better approach he made a new ureteral opening and uh, ure I mean ure ureteric opening and then he did uh, then he opened the bladder um, uh, with that he did a polytano led better kind of uh, surgery uh, and uh, he documented it as uh, means before that he mobilized to the urit uh, while he was mobilizing the ureter uh, from the bladder he documented as dissected at the vuj with a mucosal cuff he was mentioned um, then uh, after reimplantation according to the notes it was uh, the uh, stenting was done but uh, uh, with the parents history now uh, on uh, uh, and the uh, document showed post op uh, post operatively no complications was there but on post op day one there was um, anuria and uh, serum serum creat went up to 1.7 ah, okay. and uh, then uh, ultrasound at that day showed uh, bilateral kidneys with a gross hydro means hydro nephrosis on the right side with an apd of 23 mm and left side with a 30 mm and uh, according to the parents, he went ahead with on that same day and uh, open ureteric uh, standing was done. Then, uh, so after that, from uh, post of day four or five onwards, uh, started uh, noted to have a suprapubic area urinary leak, uh, which was uh, uh, subsided only after removing a non absorbable suture by another surgeon after one, one month or so. Then, from day 20 onwards, uh, he has started again to have UTI. And uh, serum creat at that time was 1.4, uh, had uh, urinary retention. Then they put it on uh, induling catheters. Uh, after one month, uh, ultrasound uh, again, both uh, means uh, velvi calicial dilatation of APD, right 22 mm, thinned out parenchyma, and uh, stent was there. And um, uh, left side, it was uh, APD of 30 mm. And uh, they, with these findings, they removed that, that stent after one, uh, one month of surgery. Then both stents was removed. Then uh, ultrasound at uh, two months uh, post-operatively, again, uh, the same findings with the gross hydro and ureteronephrosis. Ureter was uh, traced up to VUJ on the right side and uh, it was traced to uh, iliac vessel level on the left side. There was diffuse bladder wall thickness with the debris also. So it's infected system with the recurrent UTIs and uh, child was started. And then it, at this point, they was consulting another surgeon. So the, uh, he was voiding at that time. Voiding patterns also was changed. He was, I means according to the parent, they couldn't make out the differences, but he was voiding frequently, like uh, about uh, every hour he was voiding. And uh, I was not uh, um, voiding completely. So started on CIC and overnight drainage. Uh, so at, after four months, uh, one MC was done, uh, which showed uh, no reflex on both sides, but uh, the uh, ureth urethra was also normal. Um, same point they did an uh, DTPA. Uh, uh, right, left kidney was uh, functional, was preserved function, but uh, dilated and tortuous ureter with uh, delayed drainage, uh, slow flow of the uh, radio tracer, and right kidney hydronephrosis of impaired uh, function and perfusion and function. And that also showed a slow drainage. And uh, differential function was 71 in the left kidney and 29 on the uh, right kidney. So, with this, uh, the child was referred to us. Uh, at that time, the issues were right infected hydro ureteronephrosis and uh, unable to clear with the antibiotic and left side obstructed hydro ureteronephrosis. 
Serum created admission was 1.3 with the bladder dysfunctions so with the significant post void and, and child was on CIC. Uh, not sure about the posterior uteral valve as the histories were um, uh, of fulgation is not clear. So unable to do the UDS, uh, the child is always uh, had an infection and uh, debris was in the system. Able to do the Euroflow, uh, the child was voided about uh, uh, 70, means 50, between 50 to 100 ml only was voiding and small volume uh, Euroflows only we were able to get. Uh, with that, uh, we did an ultrasound. As you can see, both the kidneys were uh, hugely uh, dilated and uh, uh, kidneys, right kidney was uh, uh, like uh, uh, with the debris. Um, uh, as comparing to the previous uh, ultrasounds, the left kidney's uh, dilatation went up. So both the ureters were dilated. As you can see, the right ureter is uh, hugely dilated and tapering towards the bladder and was um, more opening towards the anterior uh, of the bladder. The uh, same story was on the left side also. So we went ahead with the cystoscopy. Findings were urethra was normal. There was no uh, features of valve. The bladder was smooth walled and uh, left UO we were able to identify on very lateral ectopic place and uh, we were able to do a like not complete RGP. We uh, put some tie to confirm whether we are inside the ureter. Then uh, DJ standing was able to uh, do one that. Side. Can we stop yes. and discuss it at this point? Yes, sir. What is going through your mind? I mean, I know you will complete your treatment, but before that, um, we can discuss a little bit. Like, what is this? Is it a case of posterior urethral valve in your mind? Uh, with uh, after. Do, before doing the cystoscopy, sir, um, uh, with the MCUs was showing the urethra, but uh, a clear image of uh, urethra on the oblique image was not there, sir. And uh, and uh, uh, when previous PUB vulgaration was done, uh, uh, history was there. So can can be a, a PUB also, sir. Right? Can but be when you look at the counter I... of the bladder on the MCU now, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, I, I think. Um... I was not very sure about this history yes. at all because the bladder is very smooth walled. Very smooth. It doesn't look like it's a PUV smooth. bladder. So the urethra also was completely normal. And the fact was both pre and post so-called fulguration, there was no change in the hydrouretonephrosis at all. It was just the same. There was no improvement uh, in any way. And um, so, I mean, we still see that, but I was not convinced about the PUV in this child. But it, it did put a, a doubt in my mind that whether this bladder, whether the reason for the failure of the reimplant was because of a bladder problem or was because of some improper technique or you know it was a, a complication of the surgery or was it just because it was a bad bladder. So we did have that doubt in our mind, but we were Does unable to- More like a neurogenic problem now, acute neurogenic problem rather than anything else at the moment. So the that was the reason actually the child the came- the child was brought to my attention first at, at two months post surgery. So that's the first time I saw this child. And at that point of time, child clearly had features of a neurogenic component, was not able to void. And I was the person who started him on CIC with overnight bladder drainage. And over the past few months, so now the child is about five months after the first surgery. So over the past few months, the voiding pattern of the child has improved. So as you saw in the MCU that was done at four months post uh, reimplant, uh, by the second wide child is able to actually empty the bladder, which was Correct. not there in the first, uh, in the, the, first, the two months post reimplant, it was very bad. Um, so we were thinking more, that is the reason why we didn't intervene, uh, why we didn't intervene in this child earlier. We just put the child on CIC and we said, okay, let's just give it time and see what happens. However, this, this picture that you see in this ultrasound is five months post reimplant. And you can see that the right kidney is always having debris in it, is always infected. And the left kidney, which was actually not so bad preoperatively, if you saw the ultrasound pre reimplant of the left kidney, it's actually a pretty good kidney. And this left kidney is also grossly dilated with an APD of 30 millimeters. So, you know, we were concerned. And also the creatinine had gone up. So, preoperatively, it was 0.7. Uh, at the time of infection, it was 1.7. But then he was still sitting at 1.3. So it was at this stage that we decided that something needs to be done. We can't leave this child like this. Was the ureter proportionately dilated or the pelvis was more dilated than the ureters in this case? So see, you go to the picture showing the bladder. Yeah, so that is the right, that is the right ureter. 
I leave you to make your own judgment. That is the right to return. Okay. Now, what they had not told us or what we had not found out from uh, prior to uh, sending to us was the right ureter um, seemed to be ascending along the lateral wall of the bladder and appeared to be entering into the bladder on the anterior, anterolaterally on the bladder. Same thing on the left. So the left ureter was a shade less than this. So right ureter is quoted as 25 millimeters in diameter and the left ureter is quoted as 20 millimeters in diameter. And both of them are ascending and uh, laterally on the bladder and entering anterolaterally. Can I ask a, a question? No. Yeah, please. One thing is, I mean, did you try catheterization and did it cause any difference in dilatation of the ureter? So we have put this child on indwelling bladder drainage a couple of times in an yeah. effort to try and get this infection under control because every time he uh -huh. was infected. And did it cause any? No, it didn't yeah. make any difference to his dilatation. Right. right Interestingly, right. he would he would have a diuresis when we put a catheter in. He would diurese. So we were sure that it was not right. completely obstructed, but the dilatation right. of the upper system was static even after catheterization, yeah. okay. and we were not able to clear the infection. So then the question was, what do we do? Percutaneous nephrostomy would it have helped, Lakshmi? Yeah, so that's it was uh, the right side on the right side. Can, can we go to even our with management? the drainage? You're not yes, able to yeah, control yeah, the please, just it go look, Looks like a view, Jay. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, so that's what uh, uh, Lakshmi, we, Lakshmi, the problem now is I think right huge obstruction because of previous surgery. Even left, right side, even left side also partial obstruction. I think you will end up in re re implantation, both sides. So go on to the next one. It yeah, completed right the side, treatment, but it's done a little bit. Yeah, sir. Uh, side. So uh, we went ahead with the, like uh, I have uh, already discussed, like uh, right side. Oh, okay. we, left side, we were able to do a standing, sir. Then uh, right side, uh, we, were not, uh, we were not sure about the urinary corifice or not. We were not able to. Uh, that also was noted on the anterolateral aspect and uh, was not able to cannulate. So right to percutaneous nephrostomy and left uh, DJ standing was done. Mm. This is a short video to show that uh, uh, left ureter, which is more on the uh, lateral aspect, as you can see, the lateral wall was uh, making as this one difficult to put a stunt. So my uh, feeling on what I saw was uh, the surgeon has one done bilateral extravesical mobilization quite extensively, and that's probably caused uh, a neurogenic component to his bladder. Correct. But, in, but in addition to that, after that, uh, so after the complete extravesical mobilization and all that, after that, he has opened the bladder. And I think he's gone very lateral. So instead of going on the posterior bladder wall, he's actually gone on, you know, lateral bladder wall to do his so-called polytunnel that better. So it's a... Um, yeah, probably he didn't know how to expose the trigone by putting some gauze piece and pads. So he just re-implanted like a transplant re-implantation. Can, can I ask a question, Ramesh? Yes. What is the, the CKD scoring? How, how bad is renal failure now? Somatic growth, renal creatinine, creatinine clearance versus the body age. And is the patient likely to go into renal failure? He is, in, he is in mild renal failure. At the moment, his creatinine, he's just about, he's less than a week since this cystoscopy and stenting at the moment. So his creatinine, mm. which we checked on day two post-op was 1.3. He's due for another check tomorrow. His urine has cleared. There's um, a CKT scoring, no? You can do that. And if he, he must be already grade three, I thought. Yes. He must be, yes. Hmm. He must be in grade three CKD. Yeah. I, I grade, have a grade three is mild, isn't it? Grade three is mild. I have a comment which I heard a urologist, adult urologist make. He's from Chandigarh. He's practicing in Chennai. He said now the number of trainees in adult urology has increased and the volume of training they get is pathetic and they do horrible surgeries. I don't know why they double with the pediatric surgery and spoil the kids' lives. This is very sad. That's his uh, we, we'll go into the management of this case. Um, so no, I, Lakshmi, I have a question. I'll just finish this. So I just want to finish this. So after this... Yeah. Uh, so over or somewhere is there? Just this last time, yeah, oh, oh, this is the last, this last yeah. slide. So just to say that after this, so the child was on CIC prior to this, but now I've got a stent on the left side. 
So I was a bit worried about uh, doing a CIC if it tangles and then the stent comes out. So we decided not to do CIC. We're just waiting and seeing what he does. So we've been doing repeatedly post void residues. So he voids about 50 to 100 ml um, at a time. Maximum he has voided is 150 ml. And uh, every time his post void residue is 20 ml. So for the moment, we've left him without CIC. Um, and so the his plan at the moment is. Be high, to, no? Sorry? His bladder pressure, the volume is so low, it must be high pressure bladder, no? His bladder is actually very smooth on the inside. When I did. Well, I'm saying, know, what is this uh, storage pressure? We haven't done it. We haven't done urodynamics because he was infected until last week. And now he's got a stent in his bladder going to the kidney. So I don't know how much uh, urodynamics is going to be worthwhile, but he's hardly a week since the uh, UTI. We've started antibiotics. He's just now cleared his UTI. So we haven't done urodynamics for him. I have a question. See, now that you have put a stent, how long are you going to keep it? So we wanted to leave him for a month because the but problem is, is not one the side, stent. One yeah, side the problem stent is not the stent. The other side is the nephrostomy. I'm going to leave him with the nephrostomy for a month. Right. I mean, why you elected a stent? I mean, bilateral nephrostomy would have been much easier, right? Very difficult to manage. No? They are coming from I know. Poetry. I know. But the stent is like you are not able to clear that mm. infection with the stent because... No, 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 no. His left side has not been infected. It's always the right okay. system which has been... See, the right VUJO, the interesting thing is, if you see the notes of what the adult urologist has written, he has dissected the ureter down to the VUJ. He has cut it out with a cuff of bladder. He's closed the bladder. Then he slit open the VUJ. He has not excised the VUJ, according to his notes. On both sides, he has just slit it open and he's not excised the VUJ and he's just re-implanted that. I also saw that he has disconnected the you know rectus muscle from the pubic bone. Ah, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that will be interesting when we go back in. Mm. Now, so, further management of this child, mm. I have an odd feeling that this child is going to need a redo of whatever they have done. Yes. He probably needs a reimplantation with or without tapering. Yes. But the question is, will you add a metrophonoff also at that point? Because he's going to need a CAC. See, I think if they pay, if they are very compliant for CIC per urethra, then why should I add a metrophonoff now? No, I, I, it's actually better because on, I can always add. You know, uh, <laughs> you can add, but as Dr. Kiske has cemented, he needs a bilateral reimplant and metrophonoff at some point. He needs a bilateral reimplant, which I'm planning to do, and whether I'll be able to do a proper reimplant or we might have to do your nipple reimplant, I'm not well, sure. Well, yeah, that is other thing. I mean, a proper implant is going to be a challenge because uh, the entire area is going to be a problem there. Yeah, yeah. So parents have been explained. Um, parents have been told that um, we might need to do a, a staged implant. We might just need to do either a refluxing implant first time or depending oh, on what and they find. Another, another option which, uh, which is actually allowed thinking, whether it is right or not, I don't know. If the, the longer the torture you return, you can do a proper Cohen type of re-implant. And then the shorter one, you can do a TUU, transurotary uterostomy. Yeah, the, the, least, we did an RGP or a partial RGP on the left at the time of uh, putting the stent. And the left ureter doesn't seem very, very long. It seems to be quite, uh, you know. So it must be it must be having some degree of dilatation and some degree of tortuosity, but it is not that tortuous. Whereas the right ureter, I think, is, is probably tortuous. And, uh, yeah. I yeah. don't know. I don't know. It's very big, but I don't know how tortuous and how... Well, good luck with this case. It's a very interesting case. Yeah. Will an MRU help to... Will an MRU let, help? Let, let, let you know the length of the ureter because if it is not, the, you know, opacified yeah. in other methods... Because we're really planning working. to do a nephrostogram later on. Yeah, so when he comes back, we're planning to do a nephrostogram. We're planning to do... If he's not infected, whether it is possible to do a video urodynamics... That is also yes, on that our is mind. also useful. But uh, as you say, because the bladder is looking so good, mm. it's possible that he has got more of an emptying problem than the pressure problem. Mm. You know? Mm. But yeah. he emptied on the MCU. The last film he emptied. He, there was so not by the second problem. void. I mean, today, I mean, uh, now for the last few days, that's what we've been doing. We're checking his post void repeatedly. Every time he empties, leaving only 20 ml. So it's not a very big... Mm. This, this surgery was not done in Chennai, is it? No, in Trichy. Okay, so, okay. 
anyway actually the uh, i think this is a very complicated com com i mean complicated surgical complicated patient because a uh, patient will go into renal failure i really wish you good luck because you're so patient and not criticizing the surgeon primary surgeon that's amazing <laughs> and uh, i well really i must say I, i i just want to say that the parents have spent 4 lakhs at the primary with the primary surgeon and they are they are here in my general ward and with a bill of um, 50 60000 they are asking me for um, discount and they are saying for the next surgery can you give us discount or can we do it in the government <laughs> scheme okay and you are a pediatric <laughs> surgeon right so you should be a pediatric uh, I support see patients from neighboring countries same thing happens where the where the patients don't have um, i mean uh, the the uh, every doctor should only practice what he is capable of doing and he should not go out of his zone of competence so if he is not used to doing pediatric surgery or pediatric mm-hmm. urology he shouldn't be attempting something that sort of thing is not that ethic is not present in in a person what do we do we are struck and uh, we have to face the problem So I do see some patients like that from Indonesia. Sometimes I use them from Myanmar and all that, and uh, they are like some of the strict in India. But uh, the cities generally, it's very good in India because they have very good trained, very well trained people, you know. But I feel so sorry for these patients because nephrology support is also poor. Renal transplantation, we don't have cadaveric transplant at all. So with all that, uh, this sort of it's a very big challenge for all of you guys. i'm just happy that i'm out of india for some time but i have to come back and face but i probably will not practice anymore we'll dr. come back dr dr <laughs> sandeep dr sandeep yeah. you want to yeah dr lakshmi yeah. can i just make a comment please uh I, this this child has been chronically <clears throat> obstructed both sides and uh, the uh, definitely the vuj has been a problem in this child neurogenic component uh, there is a, a significant contribution to that as well i know the post voids have been uh, not too much but i think the next surgery which is going to be a bilateral reimplant very likely is also going to contribute some more to uh, denervating the bladder in some some extent uh, possible But you I'm really want that... i don't have to go posteriorly at all because uh, the, the surgeon has made it easy for me he's uh, implanted it yeah. laterally on the bladder so hopefully i don't yeah. have to go posteriorly much to the bladder yeah, I, i i fully understand that but i feel that uh, the bladder has already taken a lot of hit and mm. the child is in renal failure the next yeah. operation you really want that to be the last operation and so mm. I, i i think uh, i would i would strongly consider putting a mitrofenov because this child will need really reliable drainage not just for the not just for uh, short term but actually long term uh, and and possible preservation so this this keep in mind i would think that a mitrofenov with the reimplant will be the last operation this child will treat mm. and transplant is don't worry <laughs> see i i just say something dr mitra would if you show this patient to professor mitra he was my teacher i really respected his views he would say yaar isko bilateral urethrostomy kar do let them recover economically first that would be his answer which is that's I exactly think, what i was i had i had counseled them initially even before going for this nephrostomy and uh, stenting parents were counseled even for bilateral urethrostomies and the only reason i didn't go for that is because i don't know how much ureteric length is there no, and by doing no, urethrostomy no, no, no. i am compromising even further on ureteric length so that's why we didn't go for that um any of the other seniors who are please logged in we would really like to get your opinions on this yeah lakshmi nice uh, very nice and all the best is not going to be an easy case to do <laughs> but uh, but i i would agree with you i would not do a mitrofen of uh, so early hmm. yeah give it a chance because i think the child is voiding well it's not primarily a bladder problem it's primarily a, a ureteric problem vuj yeah. so it's like a misadventure of uh, reimplantation so i don't think the bladder is so much of a neurogenic bladder as it's being made out Uh, the mcu doesn't agree with the uh, neurogenic bladder and neither does uh, your clinical finding that the only 20 ml of uh, urine is uh, left post void so i think give the bladder a good chance i think yeah. it's going to it's going to do well in the long term thank you thank you dr rasmit initially when i saw the child his uh, bladder was 
truly neurogenic because it was not emptying at all and we had to start him on CIC. But I think over the past few months itself, it's it has shown a lot of recovery, yes. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, all the best. Sergi is not going to be here. <laughs> I mentioned something uh, not academic, please. And no ureterostomy. I, I do not agree with the ureterostomy because what happens with the ureterostomy is you lose length and the, and the distal ureter shrinks. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I agree. It, no ureterostomy. Uh, when, when it shrinks, then you have a tough time reimplanting it. Uh, so don't defunctionalize the ureter directly, go in for a reimplant. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is what um, I was thinking mm. about. Yeah. I'm sorry to just add a point. If the ureter is devascularized from the top end and the bottom end. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. So the, so another reason why not to do ureterostomy. Um, there is something I want to mention, non-academic. It is only sharing in the great point that uh, some pediatric ur uh, urologist not able to take a stone out on two exploration and the third one they did with the uh, adult urology hospital. Now the patient sues the uh, surgeon and uh, the judge says you are not a urologist. This has happened in India only. Now very interesting that uh, every conference I come to Chennai, a lot of such papers where adult urologists are mainly reimplantation, not other operations, and they have been misadventures. Not one patient sues the adult urologist. Um, <laughs> so as a community, I know big people are here. It has to be emphasized to non-medical administrative people uh, that the pediatric has to be restricted to pediatric. I know great professors are here. They have to do something. Thank you. For the sake of this child, not for me. Thanks, Kumaran. I don't think we have an answer to that. Dr. Vikesh, <laughs> are you logged in? Would you like to say something, please? Yeah, I, I just uh, followed uh, the later part, part of the discussion, so I'm not very well aware about the case. So it's difficult. So it's a child who basically had bilateral ureteric back. re-implant for one side BUJ and another side BUR, uh, yeah, yeah. and has come to us with uh, bilateral obstructed systems from, you know, it's basically a obstructed re-implant. Yeah. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to log in. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm sorry for logging late. I got free just now from the meeting. Sorry for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Lakshmi. Thank you, Lakshmi. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. Nice meeting. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, hope to see you all next time. Bye.